Welcome to Platforms, Networks, and Economies of Scale. We're going to do three things in this video. We're going to cover platform effects, and for our purposes, platform effects are synonymous with two-sided marketplace effects. And to understand that, we need to understand network effects, and we need to understand economies of scale. Before we look at two-sided marketplaces, we need to understand what the traditional business model is. And of course, we know this. The traditional business model is a company goes out, buys wholesale inputs, turns them into a finished product, and sells that finished product for a markup. Okay, steps one, two, and three. So for example, if I go over to a Safeway near my house and I buy a sandwich, a salad, and potato chips for lunch, Safeway has gone out to their suppliers, bought those ingredients, and now they are making me a tasty sandwich and I get to have lunch. So this applies to the vast majority of companies out there and the company simply profits from acquiring the good or service and then selling it on at a markup. And so we can see the formula at the bottom. It's generally represented as, say, gross margin in this transaction is equal to my cost for buying lunch minus Safeway's marginal cost of goods sold. And then with that gross margin, Safeway can hopefully turn a profit. I'm sure they do. Uh, after accounting for the marginal cost of labor and overhead and all of that fun stuff. So traditional business model, exactly as you were expecting. On the other hand, a very interesting two-sided marketplace model looks a little bit like Airbnb. And so on the left-hand side, we've got the guests, the people who are booking. On the right-hand side, I'm lining up the hosts, the property owners who are renting out rooms or guest suites or farmhouses or what have you. And in the middle, Airbnb is making a market. They're traditional market makers. They're facilitating the transaction between buyers and sellers. And in this case, I think what's so interesting about Airbnb is they generate revenue as a commission percentage on the total sales facilitated on their platform. So we note here that unlike Safeway, Airbnb never has a traditional cost of goods sold. Airbnb isn't buying a hotel and then renting you those rooms. Airbnb exists to facilitate that transaction. And that's what makes Airbnb so interesting. Or we love to hate on Airbnb, so watch my other video on that. But it's also what makes Airbnb so interesting, why I spend so much time thinking about it, talking about it, and identifying both the pros and the cons of doing what they do. And to understand platform economics, we want to look at the two main drivers of profitability on a platform, and that is cross-side network effects and massive economies of scale. Uh, the two of these aren't the, the required, say, in a very strong manner to have both of these in order to be profitable, but the most profitable companies have very strong cross-side network effects and very massive economies of scale. So first, cross-side network effects. Larger platforms attract more customers because they attract more suppliers. So in other words, as a user, I'm worried about the suppliers, not so much what other users are doing, but how, how many suppliers there are in a particular market. So if there are a lot of users like me, well, guess what? That attracts suppliers. If there are a lot of suppliers, that attracts more users. If we have lots of users, that attracts more suppliers, and so on and so forth. It's a recursive cyclical pattern. And in Airbnb's case, it looks a little something like this. Let's say Anna is an early adopter, and she finds herself in the enviable position of being in a market where there are four local Airbnbs and no other customers. Well, Anna's going to benefit at least two ways from this. She's going to benefit from the availability but also the competition is likely to drive down prices. So Anna is likely to get a really good deal on her Airbnb. And, and this was kind of a, a, a fact of life in 2011, 2012. Um, booking on Airbnb was fantastic. I had so many great trips uh, early on um, and I've never had one since, uh, to be honest, because I was essentially in Anna's position. There were a lot of guest rooms available and Guess what, though? Since there are all these rooms available and I was getting such a great deal, it's not long before word gets out and people join Airbnb and start booking themselves. Well, I mean, that's good for Airbnb, but it's bad for the other users because that raises prices and increases or, or decreases the overall availability of products on Airbnb. So now that we've explained the, the, 
the basics, let's take a step back and look at a few more examples of platforms. The one that, uh, apart from Airbnb, that I'm most interested in is the Apple App Store. And I call this a very strong platform in the sense that they have such a tight hold between the users, the iPhone users, and the apps that those users are going to be installing. There's, there's, there's virtually no way around that, and Apple controls the entire payment, the entire payment method uh, you know, as the, the facilitator of this transaction, of this app marketplace, if you will. So on the left-hand side, we've got our app makers, uh, Sneaky Sasquatch, if you're looking for a game. Actually, I don't know, I haven't played it. It just looked cute. Uh, Zoom, Netflix, we've got our users on the right-hand side, and app stores in the middle generating a 30% commission revenue. That is amazing. And the, we're gonna see that in a minute that Google only gets 15% off the Play Store. So we can guess that this 30% on the App Store comes from this really tight ecosystem that Apple has. If you're an iPhone user and you want to get an app, you really have no other choice. Like, what are you gonna do, switch to Android, right? So you, you end up paying this, you, you pay this as a fee to the, uh, technically the um, app maker pays it, but the app maker has to raise rates to um, uh, pay their tax, so to speak, to Apple. So speaking of which, here's Google Play. Same basic setup, only I've swapped out uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon on the top left there. Same general idea about the user base on the right hand side. And as expected, Google charges a lower commission for users to purchase on the site because what are you gonna do? Are you gonna switch to Apple? You know, more likely. Uh, and I, this, I'm an Android user, but I 100% I understand the, uh, the rationale and the economics of the marketplace. The final one is, is a lot of fun because we're absolutely under no illusions that when we buy on Amazon, that we're not buying from some company called Amazon. Right, I mean, and we do know when we're buying batteries or some things that Amazon stocks books that we're buying from Amazon. Uh, so when you buy your, your cell phone umbrella or your dust slippers so you can clean your house while walking around or your actual wine cooler, which, which I love the dad jokes in me, just loves the idea that we have a cooler for wine. So we understand that Amazon opens up their, their system to allow companies to sell directly to consumers, and in exchange, Amazon takes a 15% commission. If we think about why platforms, or at least this understanding of platforms is interesting, it's because of the most profitable companies in the world, uh, or the companies that have the highest uh, market capitalization, which are, you know, they're related. Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Visa, the last of which I'll get to in a few minutes, all of which benefits strongly. Some of their competitive advantages, uh, especially their strongest competitive advantages, are often created from two-sided markets. Now, we talked about cross-side network effects, and to some extent that was putting the cart before the horse because we, all, we need to talk about network effects. What, what does network effects mean? Network effects means a, a situation, a, usually a, a digital situation, um, but uh, there are some analog equivalents where adding an additional user brings more value to all of the existing users. Uh, so that's a unique scenario. Most markets don't work like that. Usually there's competition between users. Uh, in this case, there's actually um, a positive synergy with adding additional users. So we can explain this in terms of, uh, of phones. So let's imagine a world where there are no phones. And uh, my brother who lives about four miles from me and I somehow pay AT&T to run a phone line between our house. Now I'm ecstatic from this because I get to talk to him, I call him up, tell him all about my uh, business ideas and YouTube videos. And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. So he, he's maybe not as, as happy, uh, but you know, I guess he's, he's reasonably happy from this setup. He gets happier when we add, say, my parents or the office, I don't know, my office or his office, uh, or Ginny at 8675309, or the place at the end of my street that sells excellent Thai food for takeout. Now, I'm really happy to have the Thai food takeout on the list, so that makes me happy, it makes other people happy, 
But think about how happy they are to be joining a network with six people, or uh, excuse me, five people, instead of a network with just one. So there's an increasing amount of value for the Thai restaurant to join the more users that are already on that network. So we call this strong demand side economies of scale. And essentially, this is a scenario where more users leads to more value for existing users. You'll see network effects in many contexts, but the simplest, the ones that are easiest to understand are software, and, and from my perspective. Uh, so I use Zoom. People prefer it, well, because it has some technical advantages, but mostly because everyone just uses Zoom. So to some extent, it's easier than trying to coordinate across 15 different uh, video conferencing softwares. And then Microsoft Excel. It's just that once you're using Excel, I need to use Excel so that we can read each other's files and work uh, more quickly together. And then, of course, Instagram is a great example as well. I want to be able to see my friends on Instagram, so the more friends on Instagram, the better. But more importantly, I want to have my friends on Instagram to like and comment on my pictures too. So it's a, it's a two-way value in this case. The last thing we'll do very quickly is just cover economies of scale, and, and I, I do mean this to be very basic. Economies of scale are implicit in all networks and platforms, but they're not sufficient to explain the strategic power of networks and platforms. In other words, lots of things have economies of scale, but very few things are actually networks or platforms. Okay, that's, that's, that's critical here. And it simply says that an increase in production or output leads to a lower cost per unit. There are scenarios with low or no economies of scale, uh, plumbing, uh, electrical work, uh, custom travel or trip planning. Uh, they don't have a lot of economies of scale. They're very labor intensive. Uh, so you might see an estimated curve that goes up where each slope, each, each moment in the line, the slope is the same, so the cost per unit to produce is about the same over time. So that's a no economies of scale context. But what we're interested in are these digital environments, especially where there are, are extreme economies of scale, where economies of scale go down to, to, to virtually nothing, just the cost of a couple extra gigabytes here and there of storage, where as you go up, it shows that it's much cheaper to produce. And in these cases, you're likely to see winner-take-all kind of markets. Markets where barriers to entry grow dramatically as the incumbent companies are growing and gaining even more efficiency with their economies of scale. And so, of course, it goes without saying that almost all large companies are going to be benefiting from economies of scale. It's a fairly pedantic point, but I'll make it anyway. As a wrap-up, we're going to look at a, a, a magical scenario where all three, network, platform, and economy of scale effects, are both present and very strong. And it's that company I promised I'd talk about, that is Visa. And Visa is a very interesting company because it, it does very, very little. What you think of as Visa is, is really your bank or your credit card processor. Uh, but Visa sets up the network and sets rules for how the network is used. And it sits at this uh, multi-sided platform between customers, like us, when we buy something, between retail stores, the stores we buy from, that use payment processors to get the money to the bank who provides the customer service and the rewards points and all of that uh, infrastructure that you think of as Visa providing. Uh, again, that's actually your bank. So. You can't imagine really a company that's more tightly intertwined at the center of some of the most important um, uh, financial transactions in America as Visa, and it explains very well why Visa is so profitable. They can raise their rates over time, which they have and do, and pretty much everybody in this ecosystem has to suffer and, and, and bear it. Um, you know, customers don't think they're paying it because they don't see the 4%. Uh, that the stores are paying, but the stores certainly know what's up. Uh, they would love to, to see a different system at some point. Thanks so much. This has been Networks, Platforms, and Economies of Scale. I hope you can check out the other videos in my series, uh, why Uber is so valuable relative to Lyft, why you hate Airbnb, and why Netflix isn't a platform. Thanks so much.